Welcome to the podcast series, Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafter, and today I'll be chatting to Daniel Dodderlein, founder and CEO of Oka. Oka's platform enables banks to issue white label mobile payment products to their private and merchant customers. Hi, Daniel. How's it going? Hey, Stacey. I'm fine. Thank you. And you? Good, good, good. How's your day been? How's the last couple of months been? Well, um, my day has been awesome. The last couple of months has been a bit uh, different, I would say. Uh, I guess that applies to to many people out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's been crazy on all kinds of fronts. I mean, uh, our, our clients um, and and the ones we serve with our payment services has obviously been impacted by the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic situation. Uh, we see an increase in use on our side, so. Uh, mm-hmm. In, in terms of that, I could say we're happy. Um, it's also been impacting us in terms of our fundraising. So we're scaling our business across all of Europe. It's a cash intensive exercise. And we had to regroup and rethink as the capital markets changed quite dramatically um, early this year. Um, but we've closed another funding round. Uh, and I just did that actually yesterday. So my day today has been really, really That's good. That's incredible. <laughs> it's, been, it's been different than the previous couple of months uh, when mm-hmm. we had to regroup everything. And I'm actually getting back into more operational mode, which I really like. So working with our product teams and working with our clients and working with our partners mm-hmm. to make a difference, not only chase the money. So my day so far has been really good. Well, I'm so happy to hear that. Can you give me a quick elevator pitch on Oka? Yep. So, I mean, Oka is a 10-year-old financial services pioneer from Norway. Um, we've pioneered a lot of the different sort of fintech uh, products out there. Um, and the thing we're most proud of as a company is that we invented and developed the first mobile payment technology platform in, in the Nordics. That's and huge. we launched the first mobile payment service in Norway. Today, uh, Auka as a regulated uh, financial services technology company is pr- providing the service called Settle. And Settle is basically a payment app um, connecting all of Europe, enabling consumers and businesses to pay and get paid, manage their money and, and build their business without relying on hardware. So that's what we do. Awesome. Tell me about your journey to building your career and business. I'd love to hear. I'd love to share. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I just turned 41 and, and I look back at, uh, at a fantastic journey as an entrepreneur, uh, fantastic in terms of a lot of learnings. And I'm very humble for the opportunity I've had to, to build multiple businesses throughout my life. Um, I, I guess if, if we want to go all the way back and I'll try to keep that brief. Um, when I was six years old, my, my grandfather came home from the U.S. He worked there for a while and he brought home a Macintosh 128K. And they were very strict. They live in Oslo and, and we went in there and was like, don't play around with anything in their apartment or anything. But he <laughs> opened the door to the office and he said, go in there and play with the computer. And I was like, wow, complete mind blow. <laughs> And uh, and I fell in love with that world. Um, it was a monochronic versus you know or grayscale screen. I, mm-hmm. I remember we worked with like I played with Photoshop. It had like one undo, no layers, and it was all grayscale. <laughs> so I, I feel really old telling that story. But to me, it's it's such a pivotal moment in my sort of development because I I remember it very vividly. And and I fell in love with the concept of computers back then. And I've sort of played around with it ever since. So I, I guess technology has, has always been part of my my journey as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And, and I've been looking at uh, problems that I could solve, issues, whether or not they were, were, were small or, or big, and then apply a combination of, of creativeness um, and technology to try to solve the problem. So... Um, when I was 17 years old, I started my first business. My father had to own my shares. Um, I was not at legal age to own the shares in <laughs> Norway. Uh, that was one of the first domain registrar companies in Norway. So a company that basically sells domain names, email hosting and, and web hosting mm-hmm. and created web pages. This was back in 1997. So really early internet days, I would say. Um, and, and I guess it was sort of on the back of my, my, um, my tech, um, and sort of geek, uh, the geekiness I had, I loved computer. I played with them and sort of the, the whole notion of the internet and it just blew my mind. And I, I envisioned that, you know, everyone would be online and everyone needed to be connected mm-hmm. somehow. Um, and I mean, in hindsight, I was a bit early, <laughs> But, you know, live and learn. Uh, and I built a business around that concept, um, which was really cool and, and uh, empowered me as an early entrepreneur to 
to mm-hmm. supply services on a large scale. We were doing enterprise at the time and, and, and doing hosting for businesses. So we made a decent amount of money and, and I learned how at to build. At such a young age, that must have been insane. It was it was very weird um, and it was really cool. I mean, it was absolutely a dot com hype. It was like I felt like I was riding on top of the whole of the Internet. I think I had one of the <laughs> first like two megabits dedicated uh, um, uh, like global connect Internet connectivities into Crazy. my hometown. Um, and I mean, now I have like a one gigabit into my home. It's it's a different time <laughs> altogether, but um, it, it really set the stage for me. And I learned a lot from from building that business. And, and again, it's uh, I guess it's fortunate for me because I, I, I sort of grew up here in, in the Nordics, obviously. And um, we've been fortunate enough to uh, at least um, of the course of the last sort of 15 years, been very early on in adopting new technology. So. Mm-hmm. You know, we were early online. Everyone got connected pretty fast. We were early on in terms of internet connectivity. We were early on in terms of adopting mobile. Uh, also, to some extent, adopting smartphones fairly early. Did you ever feel ahead of the curve? Well, I didn't feel like I was ahead of the curve. I felt like I was always sort of behind. Um, okay. I've, l- I've learned later that I was not. I was very early on, which was also okay. sort of a, a key learning as an entrepreneur is that while you might have, you know, fantastic ideas uh, or idea, well, fantastic ideas, ideas about how the world <laughs> is going to look like in the future and you sort of play that wave, the timing of it is extremely hard. Uh, yeah, and, and definitely. That's, that's the hardest part um, because, you know, um, I have this saying, I, I don't know if I've stolen it from someone else, but I use it all the time. It's like, um, you know, a bad idea executed really well beats a good idea any day. Definitely. And, and um, while you believe you have a you know a terrific idea, and it actually might be a terrific idea, it's just that the execution of it or, or the timing of it is is flawed, uh, which is extremely hard to know because nobody really knows the future. But that, that's one of the few things that mm-hmm. I've learned as well from from the various things I've been involved in, especially on mobile and and later on in financial services, is that um, you can create something really beautiful, uh, which which solves problems for real users. But if you get the timing wrong, or if you don't have the right distribution to get it out there, it doesn't really matter if you sort of have the the, the iPhone killer <laughs> designed on your desk. Because if you don't have distribution or, you know, your timing is off, you will never be able to challenge the status quo. How are you able to tell that the market is ready when this product doesn't even exist? Wow, um, that's a big question. <laughs> big question. Yeah, that, it's a really good one, though. Uh, uh, I, I humbly accept that I don't know the answer to that. But uh, what I can say is that um, looking at the experience, and especially now if we sort of fast forward to to my my longest entrepreneurial journey ever, which is the one I'm I'm currently on, uh, which is the the journey of financial services and specifically mobile payments. Uh, I've I've learned that the timing was wrong the first time around, but um, I also learned that if you are persistent, you will eventually get it right because mm. you know every sort of let's call it a failure, every failure along that that journey is not really a failure. It's just you know another attempt at getting it right. I was basically stumbling upon the this whole payments thing um, by random serendipity. So a friend of mine sent me a text message um, and, you know, living in the Scandinavian countries, everyone had like a Nokia phone. 2006 is prior to the smartphone. So we were all looking down at this, you know, Nokia, whatever, 6130 or whatever it was, monochromic screen, sending text messages like crazy. And (laughs) she sent me a text message uh, to remind me that I owe her some money for a gift that we were buying for a friend's birthday. I was like, yeah, sure. Um, uh, how much do I owe you? What's your account number? And she sends me this back instantly and we're like communicating. It's like on this intimate de- device uh, back and forth in real time. And it dawned on me when I had to go home and log onto my computer and use like this OTP security dongle to, to log into my internet bank and to sign the payment order where I manually entered account information, you know, looking at the screen on my phone it just dawned on me that this user experience is terrible. On one side, we can send and receive messages in real time, you know, and we know who we're talking to based on the phone number Mm -hmm. in our contact lists. But I have to sort of, I live allegedly in the richest country on the face of the planet that has access to all the technology (laughs) in the world. And I'm sort of logging into this old school interface and I'm sending money at what perceived as a freight train that might arrive three days later, who knows? 
So I decided I had to change that. I had to fix it. I had to figure out why nobody has done it. That led me on this journey, which I'm still on, which was to you know design a brand new infrastructure from the ground up, um, create a, a brand new way for people and businesses and banks to interact, uh, enabling consumers to pay and get paid in real time and for businesses to interact with the consumers, accept payments without relying on hardware, and then connecting that whole platform and system to the different funding sources, so cards or accounts. Um, and um, I mean, little did I know that it was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why I've gotten so much gray hair and, and, and gotten stuck in this industry. Uh, but um, it almost feels a bit like the Stockholm Syndrome. You've invested so much time and effort in building something from the ground up that you can't really leave it behind. But uh, the truth is that I really, really like doing this. And um, the, the services that we've created, the, the solutions for real people and real businesses out there um, are, are changing people's lives. Um, and that once you try that, once you once you get a taste of that as a, as an entrepreneur, or as a business leader, or really as anyone working in a in, in a company that that impacts people in a positive way, at least for me, you you get addicted to it, right? You you yeah. wanna you wanna do more of that, and and that's basically what we're doing today, right? We're taking the the uh, success we had from from Scandinavia, and we're trying to sort of double down and do the same on a large scale for Europe. This is such an awesome story. I know that we were chatting about how you had to launch your product directly to the market. And you can chat a little bit about that as well. But during this process, you did a lot of wrong, but more right. What were those wrongs and what did you learn from them? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the, the first part of the story was that when we made this new technology uh, and and for your listeners out there, I mean, to, to, to give some reference to what we created. I mean, we created a consumer facing payments app that you can install on your phone. And it was connected to your bank account or your cards, and you can send and receive money in real time with your phone number. And for businesses, there was various acceptance tools. So you could you could accept payments with your phone number or with your company number or your name or a QR code. All of this we, we made, and we, we had it technically ready the first time around in 2009. Now, um, the first failure <clears throat> was all... I believe that the world was ready for this, <laughs> and and that's that's the first sort of failure and the sort of timing issue. So, because I didn't have a license on my own at the time for for the reasons I explained, you couldn't really. It was it was obscene to think that you know a, a small group of entrepreneurs would apply for a banking license. Secondly, the when when you don't really have uh, a license, you depend on someone else. And you depend on on someone else partnering with you so that you can provide these services. And, and gotcha. I, had, I, I had experience from this before uh, doing my mobile services. Uh, I created the technology and the products, and then someone else, so typically media companies or the telcos, were pushing mm -hmm. this to to the users. So I was known with this sort of distribution model where you partner through others. So the first thing I did wrong uh, was that I tried to sell this concept way before the consumers and the businesses allegedly was ready. But the first partner that was not ready was the distribution. So I, I visited yeah. virtually every single bank in the Nordics, tried to sell them the concept of mobile payments and told them, you know, money is going to live on the screen. It's and at this time we had the smartphones, right? It was still early days with smartphones, but the concept of an app existed so, so we've made that and we said, this is where money is going to live. This is where people are going to interact with the money. And this is eventually where businesses are also going to, you know, collect money, especially the, mm -hmm. the SMEs. So, you know, think about the, 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 the carpenter, the handyman, the, the yeah. flea market and all of these sort of odd cases where card payments are not really ideal. Obviously, those would be the first wave to use this. We, we told this story to the banks and they just laughed and, and said, you know, <laughs> um, we... We were betting on cards. That's what we're doing. And they were fat mm -hmm. and happy. Uh, cards were not regulated yet uh, in Europe. So, you know, Interchange was making a lot of money for them. And uh, Well, they, this is pre-cards. Yeah, so, they, so they, they didn't really get it, right? So we were utterly unsuccessful. So the whole concept of getting our product, our service, our technology into the hands of the ones we believed needed a technology, so the consumers and the businesses, was blocked by our distribution not understanding or mm -hmm. wanting to step into this. So they were not ready. So that was the first mistake. It was really, really tough. And I guess it would have been really easy to just give up and say, okay, we spent a couple of years constructing technology, you know, building this whole setup, and now let's just shut it down. Uh, but what I did is that um, as, re as a result of doing my research, 
I knew that uh, in in the EU um, or across Europe, we would implement a new a new legislation, which today is known as PSD1, since we've gotten PSD2. So the, the first iteration of the Payment Services Directive. So this is EU law um, getting uh, domestically implemented in every single EU member state, even, even the sort of semi-members like Norway. Mm -hmm. And um, this, was, uh, this was the piece of legislation that would allegedly you know, uh, break up the monopolies and, and, and create more comp a more competitive landscape and facilitate new, um, new license types. And um, uh, we applied for the first license as a payment institution, uh, as we knew that this was be about to be implemented in, in law. And we got it. Uh, so that means that what we did is we we took the learnings. Nobody was ready to, or nobody was ready to distribute our our service. So uh, we went directly to the market ourselves. So we fundraised as the only VC investment that was made that year, and this is back in two thousand twelve, wow. two thousand thirteen. Um, mm. So so uh, Norsom, um, so the the famous sort of Nordic Scandinavian, originally Norwegian VC that has funded Spotify and iSettle and and Klarna. Uh, they joined us as the only VC investment that was done that whole year in Norway. And uh, we fundraised back then. It was uh, yeah, about four, four and a half million euros. And we decided to do something we've never done before, which was to launch the first mobile payment service directly to the market on our own with the first license <laughs> issued under oh PSD1. My gosh. So that was uh, scary. It was like uh, jumping out on an airplane and then deciding with a team who's <laughs> never flown before to build a parachute. Um but that was fun, and we did a lot of things wrong, um, and a lot of things right. So in terms of wrong, uh, it's basically just learning by doing, right? So how do you market a service like this when you're introducing it to a market and, and greenfielding it? It's like yeah, trying to educate the market about something that doesn't really exist yet uh, is very hard. It's even harder if you come from a position of zero trust and zero knowledge. So you know nobody knew us. We we've, we've never provided any financial services before. And and uh, also we were the first ones to do that sort of outside of the conformity of, of having a bank license. So we were nobody. Um, so many firsts. Yeah, it was uh, it was a long string of firsts. And um, I mean, we were the first ones to develop this technology, the first ones to launch it in Norway. Uh, we we're the first ones to provide these different services to consumers. How did businesses. consumers react to this? So um, over the course of one and a half years, we were alone in the market and we managed to pass 250,000 consumers enrolling and using this mm. in a 5 million population market. Um, so that's actually quite impressive. I'm, yeah, I'm very definitely. proud of that, uh, especially considering this is like 2014. And um, as I said, sort of fintech. I mean, the only fintech that was around really at that time that people had heard of was like PayPal. Mm -hmm. Um and all kudos to them for being one of the first ones. But I mean, it was it's really hard to sort of greenfield a market like that. Um, and we had um, we had you know several thousand merchants on this platform, including some larger ones. We had Starbucks, TGI Fridays, you know, Peppa's Pizza, which is the equivalent of Domino's in our parts of the world, and a um, uh, large grocery chain. Um, but we we did a lot of things. Uh, we tried to cover every aspect of mobile payments, mm -hmm. which later on has really been. A huge asset of ours, um, but you know when you start doing it, uh, introducing the whole wide spectrum of services proved to not be the right go-to-market strategy. So we reiterated, we did a lot of things um, um, over again in terms of how we market and how we tell the stories. Or wrapping products in a sensible mm -hmm. way is is also very hard. Um, I mean, tech. Selling tech right, uh, is very hard. You need to sell yeah. the story. You need to sell the, the experience. You need to sell the solution to a problem. Uh, and, and that was a first for us, really, right? yeah. because we've always sold through distribution. Talking about tech, you, you have such a love for technology, clearly. And you taught yourself everything you know about coding. Do you have any tips for those that want to learn more about coding but have no idea where to start? Yes, I mean, I'm self-taught. I don't code anymore, though, because I'm not good enough for my own patience. I have to be honest about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I was coding early on when we built this platform. I'm still the architect of the whole platform. And I guess if I have to, I can do a pull request now and then. But uh, I mean, my, my strongest recommendation is to do something you're passionate about. Um, um, I would say I, I worked with some super, super talented uh, developers throughout my, my journey. And... 
the best ones I would say are the ones that also connect with the business side. And don't take this wrong because the business side is not necessarily sort of the aggressive sales commercially driven side. It's understanding who the product is for and, and why we're making it. So the mm-hmm. sense of purpose. So I guess like I've done throughout my journey is that I've always been extremely um, focused on understanding every single aspect, which is also not necessarily the best way of, of doing everything all the time. <laughs> but I, I really like to understand what's going on and, and sort of learning from that that research journey I had when when I built this uh, this system deep diving into understanding uh, is a very good way to become good at something. Um, and understanding deeply who you're making it for and what what means something for them. So sort of defining what's the problem, what's my solution to this. And every time you believe you have a solution, sort of sanity check that by testing it towards the market somehow. Um, that's one very important skill that I've learned over time. Um, the other thing is to uh, go to the source. I mean, there's there's so much information out there. Uh, so if you want to learn how to code, find a very simple problem um, and start to design a solution for it. And then once you have that, then build it, right? Even if it's mm-hmm. freaking hard to do, build it, right? You have to do it. You have to do it on your own. If you give up, well, then you've given up, right? Then you yeah. lost. Um but I mean, people today are so fortunate because all the information, I mean, if you just go online, you can learn to code any any programming language through YouTube. Yeah. It's all it's out insane. there. Uh, and that's why I, I revert back to the fact that you should be very passionate about something because I'll, I'll actually use this story to, to, to exemplify what I mean. I went to the Rudolf Steiner School, which is a Waldorf school, and I was very fortunate to sort of grow up and 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 be taught um, in a way which was very uh, individualized. It was focusing on creativity. It was allowing people to sort of deep dive into matters um, that they cared about uh, as an alternative way of learning. Um, and you you consume information from sort of human to human. You you don't read um, books. Um, uh, so, so tutoring books, you, you actually get it told to you as more storytelling and exemplifying and exploring it yourself and you deep dive and you rewrite this several times. It's a, it's a method that has worked very well for me. Now, the mm-hmm. point here is, and, and I, I listened to this extremely interesting, um, quote and, and, uh, I think it was a podcast actually from one of this, um, neuroscientists who, who made a very fun example to try to explain why one way of learning is much better than another way of learning. So, he talked about this commitment and creativity, how that is extremely important for your execution power later on. And mm-hmm. I'll exemplify. Now, imagine we have two identical people, right? And uh, the objective here is to write a beautiful, interesting book that's going to change people's lives. One person goes down the path of, you know, mechanically becoming an expert at typing, mm-hmm. right? Which is the, it, it's an over-exaggerated example of sort of mechanical learning, right? Very, very, you need to learn these skills that will make you into a good person versus the other per, the other person travels out into the world and explores and, and, you know, fills their lives with experiences. Who's going to write the best book? And uh, I think there's an interesting sense there because obviously it makes a lot of sense to understand how to to use the machine so that you can practically create the book, meaning Mm -hmm. typing. But the person that has gone on this journey who has a lot of interesting stories to tell, they will always be motivated to learn how to type because they want to tell their story. But the person that already knows how to type has no story to tell. And I think that exemplifies, uh, you know, both my 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 uh, my education and my upbringing and and my career as a self-taught person is that if you throw yourself at hard problems, you're going to find a solution. If the solution requires that you know some tools, you have massive motivation to learn how to master those tools versus trying to master them first and then solve problems. Yeah. Right, so so go out there and venture that. out on your own and, and learn something new, but drive it by some some you know motivation to solve a problem because that's going to be the best way for you to learn something. I'm feeling motivated. Thank you for that. Um, what is Settle doing for businesses during the COVID nineteen crisis? 
Oh, good question. So um, I guess, uh, first of all, so Settle uh, repeating this is, is a payment tool, right? So it's a way for consumers to send and receive money. And it is a very simple tool for businesses to accept payments and uh, sell more by connecting with consumers. So there's an ecosystem here. Consumers have the app and then the businesses can use their tools to accept payments with this app, but they can also publish their products and their services to reach more consumers to sell. And this is where the, the sort of magic happens. So as part of the COVID-19 crisis, we saw that um, uh, consumers obviously still want to buy stuff and they mm -hmm. need to buy stuff and they need to interact and doing financial transactions and shopping and payments digital has seen a natural and sort of self-explained boost. So you don't want to deal with dirty cash. You don't want to physically, mm -hmm. you know, hand over money. So doing it digitally has gotten a natural uh, boost. Uh, and we've seen that. Uh, we have some, some interesting metrics. Um, the last report I got was that the individual ticket size on our payments between people has increased with some 21, 22%. So, Insane. Yeah, so that's that's quite good. Now, on the business side, uh, we want to empower businesses uh, and even individuals to create new businesses by utilizing the Settle ecosystem, not only to accept payments, but also to sell more. Now, selling more means reaching a new audience. And this is, this is what we specifically did uh, related to the COVID-19 crisis is we created a new product. We called it Settle Quick. And Settle Quick is a tool for a business to uh, market a specific product or a bundle. So let's say, you know, your morning coffee or like a breakfast deal. You can imagine all of these like standardized bundle stuff that you could buy and promote them to the consumers on the platform uh, and then enable a, a prepaid order to be created by the user. And the benefit of this is that, uh, first of all, you sell more because you're targeting new customers in this ecosystem. Um, but from a COVID-19 perspective, you can keep your business open by selling remotely, right? You, mm -hmm. you are not reliant on random people stopping by your physical store. Yeah, You can actually open up a shop on people's phones and accept orders that are electronic and, you know, no contactless. Um, and then get paid for those orders. And then the person could either come and pick it up or you can deliver it depending on what services you offer. That's awesome. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Where is the best place to reach and connect with you? Oh, I'm uh, I'm on all the uh, the different social uh, networks, more or less. Um, I'm stopping on Instagram actually because it's uh, it's uh, it's a time thief. <laughs> but you can you can reach me on on LinkedIn if you want to connect. Uh, and obviously, if you go and check out settle.eu, you get the web page for Settle. Uh, Alka.io is our corporate web page, and you'll find plenty of information there. I also encourage you to read about um, uh, our journey, and we have a we have a very uh, open and clear perspective on, on how we see the world in terms of fintech and payments and, and digital commerce. It's on the Alka blog. So I guess that's plenty of opportunities and channels for people to reach out. And I really like yeah. to, to hear from you. Awesome. I'll link everything down below. Thank you again, Daniel. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Daisy. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. Feel free to follow us on Instagram at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent or you yourself are looking for a new exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.